Hello, everybody, and welcome back to uh, Get The Behind Me, which is the fun named uh, podcast slash video series. We're talking about the Left Behind series. Um, uh, Kay, I love your love your uh, little beard thing you were doing there. Cattail. Thank you. Um, <laughs> for those of you who are tuning in on the second episode of a series, first question, why? Uh, second off, I'm Pastor Don. I'm the the, the pastor of this whole motley crew here doing whatever it is that we're doing here. Uh, and we are going to be working through, like I said, the Left Behind books. And I am joined by four of my favorite people in this whole entire world, not counting my wife and children. Um, <laughs> let's go ahead and we'll kind of work through. Let's kind of introduce ourselves. Uh, Kay, since you've already been showing off your mustache skills, why don't you start? Uh, yeah. Once again, I'm Kay. I'm Don's cousin. Um, I am a freelance journalist. I write stuff about like horror novels and sexual predators occasionally and any other sort of content I can get people to pay me to do. Trampolines every other once in a while. And I play bass and write lyrics in a band called Chasing the Sky. Our new album, King of the Losing Side, is untitled on Spotify. So hey for plugs. Plug your plug Go like and subscribe. <laughs> I'm Finn. I'm Kay's long-term partner, and wait, is that uh, what you think this is? <laughs> to to simplify things, I'm at this point. I am a student with my studies on pause and uh, professionally disabled. So. And by the way, congratulations on your emergence from your dragon fruit dragon cocoon, and welcome to the show. Thank you. <laughs> it, yeah, you can see the husk. It's <laughs> still, still remain. And, and I would also perfect. like to introduce the cat, Dr. Mrs. Zamboni, Babadook Galactica, Bella Chow, Caddington Bear. She's mad. She's mad at you. Anyway, that's all. I can't imagine why. Um, all right. And joining us again is our other two favorite people. I am. I'm Scott. I am a small town reporter and something of a 1950s single provider dad in this weird in this day and age still um i don't have much of an experience with these books but having now just cracked the cover i fear that i've lost at least two or three years of uh, <laughs> my life with my my family <laughs> <laughs> this is an outrage <laughs> Uh, that's exactly the same feeling we all have about this ship. <laughs> Welcome to the party. And I am his adoring wife. Aww. Thanks. You may recognize me as the mouthy sweary one from the Bible show. Yes, thank you. All right. So Without further ado, we're going to go ahead and dive right into the dumpster fire that is the Left Behind books right away with chapter one, in which our pornographic heroes do inexplicably stupid things in response to the dumbest apocalypse ever, uh, or, or so I have titled it in our outline. Um, we're going to go ahead and lead off. I know you guys all got sick of me giving the history lesson in the last episode, so I'm going to try to say less this time and let our panel of verified experts, CMTR or TMCR, whatever it is, uh, do their thing. Um, the so only comment I no, go ahead. the only comment I have on the beginning is that we were correct in the fact that it is between the between the first and second sentences. Uh, it is it starts with. Rayford Steele's mind was on a woman he had never touched with his fully loaded 747 on autopilot. <laughs> mm. <laughs> imagery of the wazoo. That sets the you tone. You didn't realize the whole how thing. bad it was until you <laughs> read it out loud like that. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I have seen pornos with less subtle introductions or more subtle introductions. <laughs> um, I will say there are it worse the ways of starting a book. <laughs> what was that? The door bell rang. It was the pizza it. man. <laughs> His pants were off. All right. So for those of you who are who are, are watching, you can see us all kind of interacting with each other. For those of us on the podcast, we're going to try our best not to talk over each other, but it's life. It'll happen. So, oh, well, I also do the minimal amount of effort in editing these things. So if you miss something, let me know in the comments. Anyway, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so chapter one, we get introduced to our main characters. 
What do you what what were your all your all's takes on this? Nobody has ever uh, been, nobody love, since oh, sorry, the, the Dust Bowl has ever been named Hattie Durham. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah. I think I read this somewhere else, but I also I fucking love that like Buck Williams is another like writer writing a writer that's just like cool as fucking shit and good at everything like better than everyone like clearly the like like how much that, wish I, the I, I don't know this if it, somewhere I wait, what did Don say uh, how much wish wish fulfillment oh somewhere. yeah uh I don't know I, this might be part of the second chapter but like just the fact that at the end he's like the one that's like white like splicing the wires from the like the, the, phone, the, the, the phone to his computer and stuff like yeah definitely like oh, the writer that is good at everything oh. He hasn't, he's behind on the reading. He hasn't gotten that That's far. <laughs> the 90s hacker Oh, it gets scene. so dumb. It's That's great. I, I, it, it I'm is, actually supportive of that. It is straight out of he Independence Day. Airplane. I love that scene in the same way that I love the movie Independence Day. It's it's so fucking just cheesy. Just when he makes it work, I just want him to whisper, Jimmy. Like, that's just the <laughs> only thing it's missing. <laughs> And also, also, that's also when he like Hattie comes up and tries to like stop him, and he's like, "All right, sugar tits, come on, let the men work." Uh, he looks at her name tag, and he's like, "Beautiful Hattie, <laughs> beautiful Hattie, let like, the men there work." There is so much misogyny written into this thing; like it's not even mm-hmm. funny. And like that is to be expected. By the way, a little bit of background: the authors for this have kind of a professional field in misogyny too. Like uh, Tim LaHaye and his wife are both heavily invested in. Uh, right-wing movements that are to the right of complementarianism in terms of how they view women. So, like, this is should be as no surprise. Yeah, that I think the- that, that was the biggest thing that stood out to us as we were reading it about the women in this. Like, all of the men keep themselves in their panic. Like, they're scared or whatever, but they keep it within, and they're like, not going to show it right now. Men are only allowed to shed a tear for the football, like the Super Bowl, and, like, birth of their firstborn son and that's a single tear they're allowed to shed and then the women in this are just screaming their tits off the whole time they're like freaking out and they constantly whatever should i do then yeah in hysterics and have to be told to calm down and yeah like across the gender lines it's just men are the one way women are the other and there is no subtlety in the viewpoints here and I'm going to go ahead and raise this because I've got the book open next to me so I can kind of throw a few lines at us here and there. One of the things that caught me, and I wonder what you guys think about it, is how they take things that would be to a normal person good and like couch them as examples of bad. Like one of the examples of that I have is Rayford is describing his wife's congregation and he says, Hers was not a church where people gave you the benefit of the doubt, assumed the best about you and let you be as if it's a criticism. (laughs) <laughs> like that's kind of what we're supposed to be doing like giving people the benefit of the doubt assuming they're good people and trying to work with them like <laughs> yeah no i definitely read that as like hers is just a church full of like absolute assholes like just these people suck right? i'm picturing nothing but judgment and bake sales yeah. <laughs> judgment brownies the worst summon from final fantasy 7 <laughs> Judgment All right. Brownie. Someone please draw Judgment Brownie. Yeah, on the list of things, like this is why we need a merch shop. Like we're two episodes into this one, but between that and Back to Basics, we need a merch shop just for that. Anyway, um, so what do you think of, of Rayford and his totally not unfaithful unfaithfulness? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's I mean, like two sentences in a row where he's like, oh, I've never cheated on my wife. But then he mentions like 12 years ago, he was at a party and he made out with some woman yeah, when he was drunk. Specifically, he's been fantasizing like, about like it ever since. Like, yeah, like uh, setting aside the language that like you mentioned, gay, like a private necking session, like what was this written in the 40s? Um, <laughs> or by like, middle schooler. Like, he's like, but I, I want to never... know how much did he pay for this private necking <laughs> session? Like, I would never be unfaithful to my wife. And then in the next paragraph is making out with some chick. Well, she's that also, the- though, I, I I chalked that up to being uh, a sort of hypocrisy that was like from the character's perspective. Maybe that's me giving too much credit to the writer. But I assumed that this character is like a womanizer and also somewhat it like hypocritical in his belief about what is and isn't infidelity. I'm. And again, maybe that's me giving the author too much. No, credit. I think you're like, right. I, I just 
think that it, it's definitely attempt an attempt was made, but <laughs> in, in better hands you could have conveyed yeah. that information. Like now, I'll give, have God damn it, trying to give the benefit of the doubt like an asshole. I'll actually go the other direction though and give a little bit of pushback on this. I've always read the character of Rayford as a conservative writing what they think a normal liberal should be. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, I don't know if the hypocrisy is an assumption of what men are supposed to be or if it is what mm -hmm. liberals are. Like, I can't tell if it's like, well, all men are like this. They just, they, they just like will have private neckings and that's not cheating. Or if they're saying liberals are hypocritical, like, I can't tell which way it is. I think, I think like they're having this weird crisis of, oh, but we're supposed to be the moral ones and we're putting on a book. And so, like, they want to have their cake and eat it too with the cheating. Like, they want yeah. it to be like, okay, no, he, he's never actually been unfaithful to his wife. He's just been tempted a lot. But then they want to like also make him like bad liberal guy. And so he's... And I, think, I think this is a theme we're going to see throughout the book or the, the book series if we make it that far is that like they they speak and write as though they're writing from a particular moral perspective but they can't seem to agree on what that perspective is mm -hmm. well, yeah but I do I do think it's establishing from a literary term it's like establishing that this character's fatal flaw is his like it's like his I was libido. saying, yeah, his libido. He wants to come. That's his fatal flaw. Is like he's he just really, really wants to get it out there. And yeah, I I, I think the biggest thing is because because we read a specific like a specific essay that was like a criticism of the book, and like the person writing it was like talking about kind of the way that Rayford Steele was viewing women, like. And using that as a way to criticize the way that, like, the authors view women, which... Um, when clearly we're shifting perspectives here from Rayford to Buck to Rayford, like, and back, yeah. and their view of the people around them. Yeah, like, it's it's written, it's written from his perspective, and so it's, like, our argument with that essay specifically was, like, that that might not necessarily be as much, uh, like reflection of the authors and how they view women but then like contrary to that when you see them describing all the women as hysterical and stuff yeah. like that that is a good example of like the writers giving away how they view women exactly <laughs> yeah. we're going to trip over that trope a lot like this book was written in 95 but we only get to page two before we get he hadn't meant to offend her he was just having fun like <laughs> the conservative tropes are all there folks uh uh why does why does it feel like everything hates women <laughs> sometimes um, i think it's everyone does. evangelicalism here what do you expect um <laughs> so scott uh, bust bust out the lappy he's got some uh i, I see notes. that you have thoughts oh i All was right. just looking, i was looking it up because i was taking notes and you're right it's not there actually you were wrong about the whole like Oh, I've never been unfaithful, and but I, I had my private necking session. It's not a paragraph away. It, there's only one sentence separating them. Oh, geez. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he was no prude, but Rayford had never been unfaithful to Irene. He'd had plenty of opportunities. That's the spacer sentence. Yeah. He had long felt guilty about a private necking session he enjoyed at a company Christmas party more than 12 years before. These sentences That's the most amazing reading one another. I get yeah, that he's is... like like uh self-justifying, but yeah. like it's really mm -hmm. hard to tell the narrator from the character's internal monologue because they overlap so much. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To piggyback on what Finn was saying that you might have missed, by the way, that was the perfect voice to read that in, and you should do that always. That's how I've been reading it. How do you else do you read the name <laughs> Rayford Steele? <laughs> All right. I, I've I've been getting a lot more into like how I how I imagine Hattie to like yeah be just like it definitely like she's from Gone Gone with the Wind just full Gone with the Wind. I'm sorry I I re I always read Hattie Durham in a transatlantic accent. You can't not. <laughs> uh, actually. Uh... Imagining like an 18th century ghost haunting a library. <laughs> oh, old Hattie Durham has been on this plane for a long time. 
Oh God, wouldn't that be a plot twist for you? Hey, I, I've only read like one chapter. Are there any plot twists? No. no. From what I've gathered, no. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it depends on what you quantify as plot, but we'll get to that later. What did you assholes drag me into? He, so, he the from the reviews I've read, the some book. of the main, some of the primary complaints in the reviews I've read are that there are no plot twists whatsoever. What what you see from the beginning is what you get. Yeah, and and I'm going to go ahead and say this here, and I'm drawing upon having read the book, my own biblical history, and. Shout out here. It's on Patheos, Fred Clark's takedown on this from years and years and years ago. Absolutely fantastic. What we're dealing with here is the fan fiction equivalent of a snuff film. It's triumphalism here. So it's it's basically written so that people can go, ha ha, we were right. Uh, and that's pretty much all this is. So let's not expect a great deal of narrative supremacy. So that being so said, in some of my analysis, assuming that these characters have arcs is probably yeah. jumping the gun a little bit. Um, um, and speaking, okay. of, speaking of characters with no arcs, we've said enough about um, uh, Loaded Raymond seven, Steel. Seven. Remington yeah. Steel. <laughs> <laughs> Rayford Steel, Nick, whatever. Um, let's go ahead. Ricky Steel. Our, let's go ahead and move forward to our other phallic exemplar, which is uh, Buck Williams. Mm -hmm. uh, who comes in next talking about all of the very, very boring events in which God literally showed up in the world and nobody cared. So, Scott, both I believe you, I believe you have detractors. notes on this, Scott. Sorry. Yeah, both admirers and detractors at the magazine called him Buck because they <laughs> said he was always bucking tradition and authority. No, this is not how nicknames work. <laughs> well, you sure for William or Henry, not Cameron. <laughs> and that's all that's a start and finish in my opinion on buck that's so that's all i got <laughs> like, i'm sorry this guy is like we talked about earlier how he's just definitely wish fulfillment for a writer like I, uh, I was gonna say scott i assume like you said you do local journalism that like you've worked in a newsroom too right uh yes or like along other have you ever met anyone that works in a newsroom that doesn't view themselves like this like Ever? Uh, long answer, yes, with a but. <laughs> <laughs> the big but yeah, butt. there's definitely a through one. So in uh, the interest of keeping us moving, let's talk about the shit that happened in Israel, like all of that stuff. Like that, I think, is the like kind of the main crux. Like, <laughs> yeah, the, the, this chapter ends with people disappearing, but like, the ridiculousness of this whole Israel arc in the middle of it, I think, is where we really need to talk about. So, I love that somebody out there thought, you know what would cause peace in the Middle East? If Israel had exclusive rights to essentially like a cornucopia formula. Yeah, they, they, the they, they wouldn't share they it share with share anyone. World hunger, <laughs> but they will not share. Yeah. And I got to say, by the way, like we talk about a lot of the ways in which this is poisonous and toxic from a Christian perspective, but the sheer unbridled anti-Semitism of there's a miracle formula that can solve world hunger, but the Jews won't let it go. Like that is like grade A anti-Semitism. And it almost flies under the radar relative to all the other crap that's here. So let's let's shout that one out for what it is. Oh, like, my oh God. God. Let's repeatedly shout that We grow corn on the moon, but the Jews. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it is like it's like holy crap like the jews were it was a closely guarded secret that they wouldn't share with anyone the fuck not and how would that make people be more peaceful with them right like none yeah, of that doesn't is, address the yeah. problems that are currently causing de like destabilization in the middle east like how does that fix what's happening in palestine wildly sure, they're not they're not sharing it with yeah, they're not angry at Israel because they're hungry. They're angry for a lot of other reasons. Iran's government's like, you know, Israel has a lot of potatoes right now. <laughs> Let's just bury the hatchet, right? <laughs> yeah. This has been going on long enough. You guys have like <laughs> the most versatile vegetable. I was like, you, you know, I know we hated you over the whole Jerusalem thing and the various many, many holocausts that have happened, but you know what? Corn. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 say, if I if I recall correctly from the text, didn't they say that like because 
uh, Israel was so completely flush with natural resources now, like suddenly Jerusalem didn't matter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. I wrote that one down. Yes, please. Oh, the global politics oh, yeah. in it are like the worst part. The walled city of Jerusalem was only a symbol now, welcoming everyone who embraced peace. The old guard believed God had rewarded them and compensated them for centuries of persecution. I mean, I'm willing to buy that last sentence happening if, if they suddenly became a verdant, like, <laughs> crop haven, but uh, why would that have any bearing on what Jerusalem is like, <laughs> right? Why would they not still be fighting over that? That's suddenly we're not going to be, like, weirdly controlling. Like, I've, I've about... only met three characters at this point in the story and now they're talking about like geopolitics in the Middle East. This is kind of moving quickly, at least. Yeah, like I mean, points for speed, but like, I, you know, yeah, no, I, I definitely the peace pacing here neighbors. is great. That's fine. Like Israel made peace with her neighbors. Like you solved the entire Middle East peace problem in one damn sentence. Like that's mm -hmm. breakneck speed. Th and this, th this, this book is. And incredibly ambitious and entirely unambitious all at the same time. And I yeah, don't know how to explain it better. It than is that. schizophrenic in its approach to pacing. Oh. <laughs> so that being oh, said, God, yeah, because there are parts of it that just drag. I forgot about that. Yeah, well, most of chapter they, two, they for example, stretch it out through so many books. Yeah. So anyway, let's keep books. things. Keep There's things a lot going. of them. Nikolai Tribulation Force. Oh yeah, it, it's good. There's go one on. called Tribulation Force. That's the second <laughs> book. We'll get there in a minute. In any case, to keep things moving, um, I'm going to, to to kick us into our next uh, section with one question that I'm hoping you guys who are uh, better suited on geography can help me with. Uh, where is the shared border between Israel and Russia? Anybody? <laughs> Anybody got that one? I was homeschooled, so I assume <laughs> through Jer Jerusalem, right? <laughs> I would just like to say, while we're speaking on our, like, qualms with the geography of this book uh something that was mentioned in a video we watched and then also that we immediately read in the book was the fact that ethiopia is just grouped into the middle east yeah despite the fact that ethiopia is not a middle eastern country africa <laughs> i mean it's a country from africa you can't expect them to know that like africa is a continent yeah, like so much of the like, geography, like we've made peace in the Middle East and all of a sudden the geography is just like, did we like have continental drift here or some shit? <laughs> oh so, so that happens and then we have a Russian attack. So before we even get to the nukes, which we'll get to, what is what do you guys think of, of the Russians for some reason suddenly attacking Israel because agriculture? Like, to me, that makes about as much sense as suddenly peace because agriculture. They yeah. need to grow potatoes. <laughs> that was a lot of planes. Like, seeking out the, uh, like, seeking out the formula, trying to get it that through surreptitious means and stuff. Okay, that sounds yeah. like Russia. You could probably make a lot of vodka out of those potatoes. <laughs> yeah, but also, like, how self-defeating is to, to be like, we want the formula. Nuclear weapons! <laughs> <laughs> like, how's that going to help you get the Yeah, because it, it seems like the, the book makes it clear that the only way to get that formula would be to pry it out of the mind of uh, I'm... What, how do you say his last Hosenzweig? name? Yeah, is that how it said? We were, we were struggling yeah. with that. Rosenzweig. Yeah, Chaim Rosenzweig, I think. Would be how, like, or Rosenzweig? Uh, Rosenzweig, I... I don't know if it's going to be a German pronunciation or a more Hebrew pronunciation. Rosenzweig, uh, hard to say. That, that doesn't, I, I could be wrong because I'm a white guy living in Japan, but that doesn't seem like a common Jewish name. Uh, I reserve the right to be wrong about that, but. Yeah. It, it did have more of a sinister Nazi sound to it. The first yeah, it really did. It. Yeah, really did. But then again, who, who am I to say? For all I know, LaHaye and Jenkins could have done their research and come up with a very traditional, normal Jewish name. Um, that's entirely possible. No benefit of the doubt. We've cleared this. <laughs> that is bad. I mean, th this is a book that talks about Russia apropos of nothing, launching all of its nuclear weapons at Jerusalem at once. And they they do make a point of saying all of it. Yeah. And as yeah, a side exactly. note, by the way, as a side note, by the way, nobody knew until it had almost happened. Like, 
that's would, the least believable part. I'll admit all. this is 1995, but even then we had like an hour's worth of warning if a missile was launched. <laughs> hey, uh, that's a question that, I, that I've been meaning to ask. This was published in 95. Is it roughly that time period? Are we talking about a sci-fi future though? Well, that's the thing where it gets interesting is it's, it's like never- AD. Like you're, you're assuming more planning than exists, I think, in the, in the creation of this book. Like I, it's supposed to be in the not too distant future uh, from a perspective of 1995. So I'm assuming 1996. Um, <laughs> so we're talking about the Russian Federation, not the current like or past more villainous iterations of the Russian government. As well. Yeah. And that, that's where it's really interesting because Russia, the Russian Federation was relatively peaceful at that point in time. So I mean, uh, benign, at least. I'm not sure why they'd attack Israel. Because agriculture. Now it's worth noting that the only reason that this is, <laughs> the only reason this is here is to fulfill some numerologically derived weirdness out of I want to see even Micah or Ezekiel about like Gog and, Ezekiel, Gog I think. and stuff like yeah. I, I think it's yeah. Ezekiel. Um about like interactions between Gog and Magog in a wartime environment as prophesied by the prophet Micah, which has nothing to do with Russia and nothing to do with modern Israel. But they've got to shoehorn that in because this whole, as we talked about with Schofieldism and the kind of pick and choosing theology that happens there, they've decided that this chapter and the chapter before it specifically talk about what's going to happen in the end times and not like shit that was happening to the prophet Micah contextually. Is this then supposed to be the, the like the biblical Armageddon? Is that well, like the battle no. or whatever? That... It's worth noting that uh, Armageddon, which actually comes from Har Megadu, literally the Mount of Megadu, is the final battle way at the end of the post tribute or this, this little tribulation period? Mm -hmm. So the, the the in tribulation theology, all of this, the, the rapture starts this whole. I think it's seven years build up to the great battle at the end. Again, and I really can't stress this enough. None of this shit's biblical. Um, so this series of time, this number of years, all of this is derivative of numerology and kind of like like kind of cramming it in unlubricated like random verses out of context <laughs> um so like if you're feeling a little sore in your backside that's probably why um <laughs> so yeah so those are two different things so what's happening here is this verse from mike mike or ezekiel is being crammed in here to, to, to like this, this whole wartime nuclear barrage is really meant to just kind of cram Ezekiel in here for no clear reason. Uh, so that's that's what's happening there. Um, so let's get to the nuclear bombardment itself. What did you guys think about that? I mean, yeah, my initial thought was nukes exploding in the air above uh, Israel, probably just as bad as like, like nukes hitting the ground. I feel like radiation and fallout would still be uh like everybody there is gonna have some problems with their agriculture supply. Yeah. What, what line was it? The part where he <laughs> that's a water. lot of radiation, my brother. <laughs> like yeah. that's a whole lot. And then when he when he goes out of the bunker and is like talking about his face blistering, <laughs> yeah. you were like, that's probably the radiation. Yeah, probably. Like he he goes to go back in and he touches the doorknob and it's still hot. And I'm like, yeah. I had that across my mind. <laughs> like, I and we were talking about also before. Had some good points about the way that, like, that, like, even as a journalist, that we assume up until this point has not been religious. Like this, this experience, like he immediately jumps to like now this he must in be God. God. Like, Instead of like, <laughs> yeah, the idea that maybe this is some form of technology that we are not familiar with in the public, but the government is like see, using some I'm sort of level, missile defense. Or... I'm going to level the criticism totally in the other direction here. Um, because like LaHaye does go pretty far to illustrate like the planes fell down and didn't kill anybody. Like there was shit that you couldn't explain by a missile defense system. Fine. Um, I'm going to criticize Buck in totally the opposite direction because he saw this shit and he's like, I, it kind of moved me to be a little more spiritual and think that there might be a God, not necessarily the Christian God, not necessarily the Jewish God. I'm like, you literally just saw a miraculous defense of Israel by some <laughs> supernatural force. You're saying, well, maybe not the Christian or Jewish God. Like, the fuck is wrong with you? 
Honestly, one or the other, even. I would take one or the other. (laughs) Like, this isn't exactly a situation where there would be a a logical middle ground here. Like, I think (laughs) God is real and he's very specifically focusing on his people, or this is some serious technology. It can't really be either or. Weirdly (laughs) enough, it was Ganesh the whole time. (laughs) (laughs) What can I say? Ganesh just really likes pita bread. I don't know. So, yeah, and like it was the same thing. This is jumping forward a little bit, but like the same with like how the chapter ends with uh Raymond Steele being like he knew I was Irene was right in the yeah, event it's like, it's... left behind, but also just, just, like drop. the fact that <laughs> yeah. yeah roll credits, <laughs> but yeah. just the fact that that also like was his first assumption, like no other potential like what could explain this like no his wife was right god was real now i'm going to go ahead and parse this a little bit i'm going to give the writers more credit than i think they deserve here um but the fact that this interaction at the end the end of the chapter is rayford standing up and deciding you know what i'm gonna get my dick wet and deciding he's Mm -hmm. all about all right i'm gonna do it i'm gonna pull the trigger on this whole hattie durham thing and i'm gonna close my eyes and pretend she's not a grandmother from the 1920s and we'll be fine (laughs) <laughs> um so he does that and she's trembling and he's kind of like getting into it and so like imagine yourself if, if you can in the mind of an unfaithful person like okay i can kind of see him jumping like oh god my wife must have been right about so many things oh god <laughs> <laughs> it's all because of me it's all because of me and my errant penis <laughs> i'm <laughs> never going to come again my sin is the reason for the rapture let's like, be honest like, that's what they want to be saying right like actually like it actually works with an evangelical understanding of sexuality there for a bit because like oh my god my dick caused the rapture like that's what's <laughs> happening now there's a merchandisable opportunity <laughs> Oh, I would buy that future t-shirt. I'm just imagining people walking around with those little rubber wristbands and just say, my dick caused the rash. <laughs> <laughs> what we're getting out of this is he's the most virile man in the entire planet. Which is exactly what the authors want to think. And I'm, I'm going to go ahead and chuck this back to uh, to that bit I told you about earlier with Fred Clark, who did the, the thing on Pathos about this. He mentions and goes into greater detail than I can because I don't know the background as well about how Rayford and Buck are kind of stand-ins for LaHaye and Jenkins, each of them in their own way. And I read this in middle school or middle school, early high school, somewhere in there and legitimately like thought at the time, which one of these guys is which? Because I've read fan fiction. Mm -hmm. I know I know what a Mary Sue is. Yeah. (laughs) Hey, Don. Are yeah. you seriously suggesting that a biblical fiction story has a self-insert protagonist? <laughs> <laughs> Let's be. This has to be a first in literature, right? And probably the best time it's ever been happened, been done. Oh, yeah, yeah, best and finest example of self-insert uh, Christian fan fiction. Yeah. Invented a new trope here, I think. Setting aside, by the way, the fact that the Book of Revelation is itself self-insert divine fan fiction. Like, <laughs> mm-hmm. setting aside that part for a minute, like, you know, the Divine Comedy did it better. We're not going to argue that. Um, but this isn't, and, and I want to be clear about this, like, we use fan fiction as kind of a, a toss aside for this, and for Revelation for that matter. But what we're dealing with here isn't necessarily self-insert fan fiction. It's self-insert snuff film fan fiction. Like that's spe- like it's it's they're self inserting themselves and by extension all other extreme evangelical cultists into a place where they can glorify in the death of everyone who didn't believe the same thing they did. Um, a weird little toss in here. Hmm. I-, I want to personally, I want I want to go the extra mile of saying it, it's like bad fan fiction. Yeah, I've, definitely. No, I, honest to God, it's not. It's not the worst art form out there. You can find people writing really good stories in other people's universes it's fun yeah anyway, oh, yeah i read the harry potter 9 11 story fan some fan. of it is brilliant neil gaiman's done that plenty of times <laughs> neil gaiman's done that plenty of times yeah fair point <laughs> yeah um, i'm not gonna put i'm not gonna put you on fans it's, it's badly written it's not it's yeah. not good it, it is I, i'd hit the back button i wouldn't finish the story especially <laughs> <since> <laughs> how long it is 
So we've gotten to the end of the chapter. And before we close for this episode, I want to steal a page from one of my favorite podcasts. Steal? Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. Raymond, going, steal it. I want to Raymond steal a page from one of my favorite podcasts. Um, for those of you who know me, you know that I'm a pretty big Star Trek fan, right? Uh, for those of you who know your Star Trek media, media I will go ahead and say out here that I am uh, uh, definitely a friend of DeSoto, if you are familiar with that reference. If you're not, that means I'm a follower of a very particular Star Trek podcast. And one of the things they do at the end is they kind of pick their favorite character uh, at the end who did something absolutely balls to the walls crazy. So what I'm going to do is I think we're going to end each episode and I want to ask each of us to pick our favorite absurd moment from the chapter. So off the cuff, you don't have to plan it. What, what, what do you think? What, what's your goal? I'm going to throw mine out there right away, and I'm going to give it to the opening line of the fully loaded 747 on autopilot, because just the sheer sexual innuendo of Rayford Steele in that moment is just like, it's a thing of beauty. Like, it sets the tone in a way that I absolutely love. That's going to be my moment. What's what's your moment, guys? I, I had to look a second, because my favorite moment so far is in the second chapter, I guess. I had to make sure it was, it was here. So you guys go ahead, and I have to figure out where I am. Uh, I, I, I still just can't get over it. like the whole like happy like just being absolutely hysterical and like Raymond Raymond. I honestly, my favorite was probably the moment he's describing his wife and like she's really not unattractive even for being forty five <laughs> years old. Like that, that was probably <laughs> my particular. It's 40. Even for 40. being forty, for being thirty, yeah. I'll be forty old. this year. <laughs> Even for being 30 years old. <laughs> he's, he's, it he's just, again, I think it shows that, like, these people prefer their women young. Like, it's a it's a very common evangelical trope that, like... <laughs> they, they went to the Leonardo DiCaprio school of uh, yeah. dating ages. <laughs> All right. Anybody else want to toss out a favorite moment? All right. Since my wife got water... Uh... My favorite moment actually is the moment where Rayford Steele is ready to um, cross that line from fantasizing about cheating on his wife to being like, if she so much as touches my shoulder, you know, I, I, you know, I'll be down to play. And he opens the cockpit door, bumps into her, and she's panicking like the whole plane's missing. <laughs> because just the mood whiplash and how sudden and early that happened, I genuinely liked that part. Yeah, I thought it was very silly. I, I, credit, <laughs> credit to the character writing of that moment. There's a moment there where Rayford's just like, I'm kind of concerned, but I'm also kind of turned on. Yeah. Uh, I, I did worry about that a little. I was like, is this guy like getting turned on by like fear right now is this is he secretly a serial killer is this gonna be like a fact yeah he kind of is <laughs> that'll come later i'm having a hard <laughs> time picking a uh like favorite moment from chapter one there's a line in chapter two that legitimately made me laugh out loud um so i'm looking forward to that <laughs> but there, there's some I, stuff i loved in chapter two Oh, Buck's, yeah. Buck's seat mate in chapter two is just, we we got to talk about this guy yeah, we'll get the, there we'll get there so, but um, I would like to just throw in the idea that adding to the oh, you've written a Mary, so you've written a Mary Sue ah. <laughs> with uh, with Buck in particular. Tell me with what little description we get of him that they're not like, oh, and Kurt Cameron could play him in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, his name is literally Cameron, <laughs> like, yeah, like they definitely had thoughts on that. Uh, All right, so. We'll go ahead and draw it to a close here and we will we'll see you guys in the next uh, episode where we talk about chapter two, where clearly everybody's favorite lines and moments are. So I'm looking forward <laughs> to that. Uh, in, the, in the meantime, links to everything are down below in the description, uh, the Discord server where we're continuing this conversation. Uh, it may surprise you with all the fucks that you've heard in this one, but this is actually a church thing. There's a church behind this. Oh my actual God. Uh, and so if you're interested in knowing more about how we can be church people and also still make fun of this shit, down there, look at the links. Yeah, we're not actually anti-Christian. We just think that no. there's stuff parading around as Christianity that is not. Actual pastor here who's doing this stuff. So, like, we, we are Christians ourselves, some of us, and we, we do this. It's a thing. Um, so, yeah, come join us. Come join in the discussion. Do the, the liking and the sharing and the subscribing, and I'm sure someone can put that better than me. 
Like, share, and accept the mark of the beast. That's the one. Yep. <laughs> Perfect. Well done. 10 out of 10. Stuck the landing. All right. I'm waiting for that. <laughs> we will see you guys on the next episode. Uh, take care, and we'll see you then. Bye, everybody. Bye.